Hello, welcome back to HOPE 2020. I want to give a big thank you to all the attendees and presenters and volunteers here for the show. Our next session is with Keegan Rankin, an advocate for free software and platform cooperativism. Keegan's talk is about sex, big data, and user autonomy. Re remember, the Matrix chat is available for your questions, and when uh, his presentation is over, we'll be right back with your questions and Keegan live. Take it away, product, uh, ground control. Thank you. Hello everyone here at Hope 2020. My name is Keegan Rankin and today I am presenting on sex, big data, and user autonomy. Just to give a little bit of background about myself right now, I completed a code camp um, in the spring of 2019. Over the past year or so since then, I have been collaborating with Agaric Tech Cooperative. A lot of my work has been giving lectures and workshops on free software, digital self-protection, and trying to help activists learn how to use communications in a safe manner and uh, teach a little bit more about our current state of surveillance capitalism and the dangers of big data and predictive analytics. And just a little bit about what's going on. Some of the work that agaric has been doing over the past couple of months They've set up a, an instance of Canvas, uh, void of proprietary software. Agaric's been doing a lot of work to um, provide students and teachers with a learning management system that, uh, that is not spying on the students, um, but also providing teachers with, it, with a great tool, um, including uh, video conferencing with Big Blue Button. And on that end, uh, moving teachers and students away from using Zoom, yet another proprietary software. So I, I guess the, to start off with this conversation, a, a big part of what I'll be talking about through all of this, and the, generally my main focus is on big data. So what I'd like to do is first uh, take a moment to sort of define what is, uh, what's different about big data in comparison to more traditional forms of data processing. The main thing about big data is that it is a, a, a data processing paradigm in which unstructured data can be analyzed, and that allows um, developers or entrepreneurs, anyone using these analytic softwares, to be able to perform analytics on much greater sets of data because the uh, because they're not relying on a standard structured set of data. So now the analytics tools will allow for the analysis of much larger data sets since it doesn't all have to be exactly standardized or anything like that. And I think one of the main things that has occurred in relation with that is that within the big data paradigm now, people want to collect as much data as possible uh, because data is power. And so just about everything we do now is... Um, is being surveilled uh, as our technologies increasingly find their way into our personal lives, and um, I, I suppose one of the one of the major threats of big data systems finding their way into our lives in this manner is that not only are they improving the predictive capabilities of our technology, but they're also uh, acting in ways to make humans more predictable. Um, and I will get into some examples of that uh, later on, actually, in this presentation. This quote I have here is an excerpt from dialsource.com. You can see the reference down at the bottom. Uh, and it's an article called Predictive Analytics to Boost Sales. This was just something I searched up to see how analytics was being used, and I pulled out this line. With predictive tools, your marketing and sales teams can better determine exactly which customers are most likely to convert and even their potential lifetime value. And I suppose this is a kind of pretty typical business language anymore where customers are sort of in a way being con turned into a commodity um, and being valued in terms of their likelihood of purchasing or their capacity to make purchases. That is I suppose one of the ways in which um, users are being categorized and as a result normalized, they're sort of being placed um, on a value curve that is that is based on their 
propensity to purchase certain products. And so the reason that I wanted to go into this conversation talking a little bit more about sex in the relationship with big data, um, well, there are a few reasons. First, to consider how far big data really reaches into our personal lives. Obviously, sex is something that is extremely personal, and if big data is operating in a way in which our sexual information is being extracted through that, then um, that's, I think, grounds for major concern. Uh, in addition to consider the implications of big data on sexual development, um, as I was suggesting earlier, the ways in which big data acts to sort of normalize indivi normalize individuals um, according to s different categories, but also its capacity to be persuasive. And so I am thinking about this in relationship with in what ways does big data affect an end users of, ver of the various um, platforms that I'll be talking about. In what way does it af affect their sexual development and potentially remove their autonomy from um, really self-determining sexual orientation or preferences or interests? Lastly, to consider the roles of sex and big data in advertisement and consumer culture. Throughout this talk, I'll be providing examples of four mechanisms in which the end user's autonomy is being degraded. And the first mechanism that I'll be referring to is uh, access to informational self-determination and as well as uh, the end user's access to consenting to the collection and or usage of their information. And so when I say informational self-determination, I'm referring to an individual's access to controlling what happens with information that's collected about them. Some of the questions that I'll be attempting to discuss here, how much control do users have over the collection, sharing, and usage of their data? and are privacy policies sufficiently transparent. So to really discuss any of the things, uh, any of the mechanisms of uh, autonomy degradation, but especially this one, I want to first describe sort of the shape of a lot of commercial platforms anymore and how they're being built. A lot of platforms are built on top of software development kits or SDKs. Typically these software kits are provided by Facebook and or Google, and I suppose in exchange for the service, the developers sort of, in, in the agreement, they are required to share information that is being collected on their app. Um, so right there, that is uh, actually something that a lot of developers might not necessarily be aware of, that agreement. Uh, that is not always fully transparent, but just to give you an idea of what the SDK is used for with I'll, I'll use using Facebook here as an example. It allows app developers to integrate certain Facebook features, and the, the primary ones are like logging in with Facebook just to make lo your login easier so you don't have to create an entirely new account or anything like that. I suppose another typical uh, feature that gets built into a lot of these apps are the Facebook like button. And uh, I guess a uh, really important to note is uh, typically the Facebook SDK is used uh, as a way for apps to really be able to to understand users' behavior and essentially to be able to sell targeted advertising on those platforms most effectively. One of the big arguments for um, allowing th these types of apps to exist that are uh, collecting so much information is if we could successfully find a way to anonymize uh, individuals effectively to make sure that their privacy is being protected. Uh, well, the, the problem with that idea is that a lot of the information that's being collected through these apps and through these platforms is for the purpose of trying to identify the individuals and make inferences about them. It's really a integral aspect of the entire business model of big data. So as far as legislation, at least in the United States, goes surrounding the collection and usage of data, there is the California Consumer Privacy Act of 2018. While it, I think, may be the most effective uh, privacy law in the United States as far as protect protecting uh, user data goes, 
but one of the problems with it is that it only prevents the sale of data legally. It doesn't actually prevent the sharing of data. Um, it doesn't do anything to prevent the collection of sensitive data. We're certainly in need of some stricter legislation. So throughout this talk, I'll be giving examples um, regarding several different types of technologies, several ways in which many of them do act to degrade user autonomy. Uh, so on pornography sites, for example, it's really typical that pornography sites are leaking their data to Facebook and or Google. I, I had seen a statistic at one point, I think it was 93%, at least 93% of porn sites are leaking user metadata. And w part of that data includes the URL that they're visiting, right? And so typically that URL might contain information regarding a, an individual's uh, sexual orientation or their sexual interests, or at least th that information can be inferred. Um, another big one, which I won't be talking about later, actually, are Wi-Fi enabled sex toys. There had at one point been a a Wi-Fi enabled vibrator, which actually um, collected um, biometric data, including temperature um, and vibration intensity, um, and uh, surreptitiously was also leaking that information to uh, leaking that information to the company the company who who uh, manufactured the sex toy. And so the final example that I'd like to employ here are the alleged reports of police using Grindr in Egypt, I believe it was, essentially where they would be using the the location data, which wouldn't display the user's location, but rather the distance from a user's location. Keep in mind, Grindr is an app for uh, specifically for homosexual men. And in Egypt, homosexuality is illegal. So the way that police would use this app, the vulnerability in this app is by uh, each of them would, three police would find their distance away from one user and then th the three of them together could use that information to triangulate and actually pinpoint the location of the user so there was a whole uh, thing around that essentially where grinder had changed some of their default settings so that so that by default uh, the distance from a user would not be um, shared unless they turned it on in at least in um, countries where homosexuality is illegal um, so regardless of whether or not that re that report was true uh, it, still it does represent a vulnerability in big data uh, ju in, in just the, s the collection and storage of information it represents uh, at times quite literally a physical safety threat because so many of these platforms have actually um, very poor um, privacy policies, which use very vague but uh, very vague language in terms of the type of data that they're collecting and what's being done with it, who it's being shared with, that information is not always very transparent. And as a result, if they're not capable of providing meaningful consent in regards to what's being done with their data, then there are arguments that we should basically be really considering that a form of digital sexual assault, um, which I think is a really good point. They should they should have complete control over who has access to that, and as opposed to sort of being coerced into the usage of platforms where they don't really fully understand. So the second mechanism that I will be discussing is uh, the exploitation of addiction and mental illness. The whole idea of addiction itself sort of is a removal of an individual's capacity to control their actions. Um, if someone is addicted to something, then they struggle to conduct themselves in the ways that they might like to. Um, so some of the questions that I'll be attempting to answer here um, are, uh, how are the apps designed to hold our attention? 
why do developers create addictive apps? And besides just the way the apps are built, is there addictive content? And are analytics used to reinforce addiction? Something that's important to note is that user behavior is typically tracked very specifically on a lot of sites that employ analytics. Um, and so in that, that provides space for a sort of iterative design process where I think a lot of apps can essentially perform a type of psychological research in order to not optimize but maximize the time that individuals are spending using their app. This whole notion of maximizing the amount of time that a user might be spending, it should be considered that the, that spending more time on an app, while it might bring in, while it might allow the developers to collect more data, spending more time on an app is not in every end user's interest and probably not in most end users' interests, especially uh, just given the state of our challenging economy. So before getting into talking about sex apps in particular here, I just wanted to point out this, uh, that uh, Facebook's president, Sean Parker, had actually um, uh, admitted that there, that Facebook was designed actually with the intention of exploiting vulnerabilities in, in human psychology, um, and that they understood what they were doing so just, just looking around uh, into the development of um, addictive products and apps, um, I did come across uh, when I was just looking into that on one of the things on the, the front page of my DuckDuckGo search was this article, Eight Secrets Designing Addic an Addictive App. The author of this article, um, Reference Near Eyal, I believe is his name, uh, who is a seems to be a big Wall Street executive who has uh, who has written some books um, actually on um, addiction and like control over attention, interestingly. Um, but he's created this so-called hooked model uh, that consists of four key points. Uh, so in the first point, he is, refers to what are the, the triggers, like what triggers um, an individual to remain hooked on a product um, and so there are internal and external triggers and the internal ones the examples in this article anyway were boredom and loneliness i think having the an app in a way depend on um, an individual's loneliness uh, is in my opinion it's kind of evil um, yeah. so if we go down to the next key point is action accomplishing something with the app in a lim limited number of taps away and um and the third one is uh variable reward and so in this points out uh that the goal of this is to satisfy their need and leave them wanting more and so i think the problem that i have with this point is just the idea that these apps are actually satisfying a need uh, i don't really think that they are necessary. Um, they're sort of the the necessity is sort of being manufactured, but the want um, aspect is really what it's feeding on. It's really, um, in my opinion, setting up users to never be satisfied. Actually, uh, to never really fully be satisfied and to always want more. Um, and I think that just plays right back into that feeling of loneliness. Is uh, yeah, that feeling of loneliness. So I was taking a look at the Tinder privacy policy, and there is a page um, under the privacy policy about profiling and automated decision making. And that uh, just caught my attention. Anyway, the idea of these ideas of profiling and automated decision making, especially um, the words automated decision making, uh, for me anyway, represent yet another very explicit um, removal of autonomy. And I know that uh, there are certainly good arguments for the, for the functionality and the practicality of these tools, but 
just because something is convenient doesn't necessarily mean that you are maintaining the user's complete control. And so I, I suppose those things are sort of always at a trade-off. And so something that I, another thing that I think was really interesting about uh, Tinder, for example, which I'll, I'll actually um, be bringing up this slide again later, but this slide it, uh, shows the number of, a, a set of statistics about the usage of Tinder. Um, and you'll notice that many of them point to statistics about like the likelihood of someone's profile being liked uh, based on what constitutes their the their profile pictures, right? So, for example, like whether or not there's a dog in the image, whether or not it's a full body picture, whether or not they're inside or outside. Uh, to me, in order to have this data, it represents that the fact that that computer vision is being utilized in these instances, and um, and I think that makes a lot of sense, right? Because this is really one of the ways in which they would be trying to um, most automate and the in, the decisions that an individual would be making is um, of course on Tinder where individuals are you know swiping left and right really quickly at least uh, not maybe some people pay more attention to bios than others but I think the general kind of stigma around uh, Tinder anyway is that it makes it really easy for users to make quick decisions based on appearance. And then that way the app does become sort of um, addictive and it's sort of a game that people can play a sort of hot or not again um, that they can just play and not even necessarily be interested in actually meeting anyone. And so I, I guess one of the things that kind of interests me about this is the type of information that might be being inferred about an individual because uh, I guess a lot of these statistics here anyway point to uh, the fact, you know, that, you know, maybe someone had a dog in their picture and that made they made them more liked or something. But I would be willing to assume that Tinder is likely using computer vision as well to keep track of what sorts of physical attributes a user might be attracted to, for example, whether it be facial structure, body structure, race, hair color, haircut. I mean, I don't really know some of these things for sure, but um, but I think a lot of this information is certainly valuable in the world of advertisement. and But also still within, tw uh, within Tinder, where uh, that information could certainly be used to put individuals that that user might potentially be more attracted to, because it sort of gives big data sort of gives these this platform the ability to understand very specifically what a user is attracted to and when we're talking about exploring other areas of the internet or targeted advertisement it seems like a pretty valuable marketing tool to be able to know an individual's sexual preferences including the things that they're physically, visually attracted to. Of course, all of this is um, about, all of this is in regards to inferences that are being made. Um, and also content always is, there's tip, generally sexual content if you're going on um, free to use websites for, for things or uh, like, the, the internet is just sort of latent with sexual material. And I think that sort of poses a, an unfairness to users who are using the internet um, but aren't necessarily interested in engaging with a platform in a sexual manner. Um, I sort of find it problematic that someone might be might have um, sexual information put in front of them at a time where they aren't looking for it. Um, so I, I guess the big, uh, this is the, the next section of this, uh, the next mechanism is uh, really control of content over content exposure. 
Um, how much control do we really have? And so just some of the questions here. Uh, does big data make us see more than we really want to see? Um, and are there ways in which we could have more control over the content that we come into contact with? And so I think pornography is actually a really interesting um, technology to be um, talking about in, in this regard, uh, given just um, the whole recommended for you targeted content, as well as targeted ads um, that are really like all over like Pornhub, for example. Um, and so I, I wrote, put at the top here of this slide, uh, the porn maze and the reason that I s sort of made that play on of a corn maze anyway is that I feel that sometimes as a user who might be attempting to navigate pornography, it's really easy for an individual to take wrong turns or to come across content that, that may not, they might not be looking for. Um, and so one of the big, there's a big debate um, within porn studies around whether or not pornographic, pornographic content should be ever be considered harmful or not, or whether or not there is a such thing as harmful content. I think it's a really interesting discussion uh, because um, on the one hand, I think people feel really strongly that violent content should be considered harmful. But on the other hand, um, I think there are views that if we consider content to be harmful, then how can how might we be shaming an individual? And so I wouldn't necessarily take one stance or the other. Um, I certainly have my opinion, which is that I think that any pornographic content has the capacity to be harmful if it's put in front of someone at the wrong time, uh, which I think is a really good reason to, as I was suggesting, I try to find ways of giving individuals more control of the content that they're exposed to. Um, and so, unfortunately, or within a porn site anyway, or even like when, you, when someone might start looking for porn or some sexual content, the first thing that, in, that someone's going to be, that a user is going to be brought to typically on the internet is Pornhub. Um, and once they're inside of Pornhub, um, a significant amount of the material is in fact violent um, and it's actually relatively difficult to find material that isn't violent. So as far as the debate around whether or not we should or shouldn't have violent material on the internet, that is not a debate that I really want to discuss so much right now as far as uh, censorship ideas. I think it's a really important discussion. Um, but just a very morally charged area. My thoughts on this anyway are that at the very least we could have better rating systems. Another alternative might be to have a bit more of a filter in process, uh, for searching through content as opposed to, uh, just having a bunch of things just kind of put in your face. So the final mechanism of uh, user autonomy degradation that I'll be uh, talking about today is dataism. Dataism is the trust in the objectivity of data. Um, even though data is uh, the entering of data as well as the algorithms that uh, collect and process data and the inferences that are made about that data, um, all of those things are things that are made by humans. So it's um, a bit it's a little bit dangerous to just assume that just because data was collected that it's entirely objective. It's just simply not true. So some of the, the questions that I'll, I would like to um, look into on this topic are, do people trust statistics enough to alter their behavior towards a norm? Do people trust apps that suggest actions in our lives based on statistics? And if so, does this make us as the users more predictable? Back to this page, which we had looked at earlier on these Tinder statistics. It's pretty typical, actually. There are several threads online um, about sort of strategizing what your profile picture should look like or what sorts of things you should put in your bio um, to optimize your chances of 
getting a match or getting people to like you. Um, and so this, I, for me, sort of represents a way in which uh, dating can sort of lose at least like the the any any amount of charm that there is with using a dating app can sort of be lost in the process of it being a game of looking for success right where the the process of using a dating app becomes more scientific as opposed to artistic and self-expressive um that's as we move into the world of data that's certainly something that we're starting to move a little bit more towards our um just a sort of glorification of science and data um and i'm, I'm moving away from um self-expression and and potentially uh um, one worry is moving away from more natural, organic um, forms of intimate relations with each other. And so another example here is, um, as I had mentioned before, sex tracking apps, uh, where a, us a user might be wearing actually a wearable device uh, and actually connecting simultaneously to a phone app that they'd be using. And the phone app will actually provide suggestions um, as to during sex, whether or not they should speed up or slow down, um, and as well as rate um, the quality of their sex, but according to um, data values that I, I don't think really have anything to do with the quality of, of an intimate relationship or experience. It's just the, the data that happens to be able to be collected, and they sort of turn it into a game of attempting to quantify something that's entirely qualitative, right? The quality of an intimate relationship, the quality of our intimate experiences. Uh, so for example, the things that are being measured are the, the speed of thrusting, how long uh, the sexual encounter uh, lasts for, and the decibels in the room. Um, so I don't, I don't think that these data points really have anything to do necessarily with the quality of our intimate experiences. And I think it's sort of an affront actually to suppose that these data points are related to the quality of our intimate relations. And so the last, um, the last example that I'll be talking about are um, the usage of period tracking apps. Um, and so I think it's important to note that it, for these period tracking apps, um, some of them do, have a built-in, some of them do sort of come with mirror apps so that other individuals, such as a um, a woman's partner who's using a period tracking app, um, so that her partner would also be able to keep track of her cycle. And the way in which this gets used is um, they will, the, the apps will remind the woman anyway, um, on her most fertile days to wear nice underwear while simultaneously notifying her partner to bring home flowers and um to that's that's fine and all i think that there is a practicality of course you know when people are using this uh to try to get pregnant or to try to avoid getting pregnant obviously you know that it's a really great function and a really convenient um tool but even going as far as suggesting um exact actions to take sure some people might take it as a joke um but let's keep in mind that um it's it's possible that that intimate relations might have some propensity as well to become somewhat routine um especially um when we are sort of con if as i'm supposing um that data uh, can be s sort of persuasive um, in regards to how we should be conducting ourselves. And the last um, the last example I'll use here now is just uh, is just gamification of intimate relationships. Um, and so with that with gamifying um, it you know when you introduce that into a relationship, it really makes you question why are individuals engaging in the intimate relationship? Are they doing it because they want to win a game on an app? Um, and could that facilitate tit-for-tat behavior um, as opposed to just 
allowing yourself to be spontaneous as opposed to just allowing yourself to love your partner when you feel like loving your partner. After all, um, I think it's pretty typical that individuals can sh give and receive love in different ways and in different capacities. Um, in what ways can gamification of our intimate relationships um, potentially take away from our capacity to just be authentic and just show our love when we want to. So thanks for listening to me talk about the ways in which big data might be degrading user autonomy. Um, I'm excited to discuss this further with anyone. Um, and as well, uh, I am leaving my contact information here uh, so that anyone who might be interested in discussing even further uh, can certainly contact me. Thanks so much, everyone. I really hope that this has sparked some thought and at least um, really helped to illuminate some of the problems that I see with big data. Hi. Thanks. Thank you very much, Keegan. That was an excellent discussion about sex, big data, and user autonomy. Very interesting. Would you like to add something to your discussion? Yeah, sure. That'd be great. Thanks. Okay, go, go ahead. ahead. All right. Yeah. Um, so I think um, one of the things that I, I didn't really get to mention enough is that uh, just thinking about the way in which uh, what I would like to see moving forward or what I would like actually to get in touch with people about if anyone uh, did collect my uh, email address or anything um, from which I think was on one of the slides. Um, I think a lot about how we want to be moving forward in our education systems and having conversations with people, teachers, educators, um, and parents um, about really how to protect children. Um, from these systems of big data so that they have the most access to really being able to um, self-determine um, their, their selves and their sexuality. Um, and so I, for me, I feel like a big, when I, when I think about this, you know, I have to imagine that um, technology is really integrated, how, just how much technology gets integrated into our lives anymore and how much, it, how much people might be affected sexually by big data and many other ways all around, but um, but thinking about sex education, um, it seems like a conversation, which I think many people are saying this and for different reasons, but sex education is just something that needs to happen at a younger and younger age, especially now that um, that we have so much access to technology and there's, there's pornography and there's so much sex and advertisements and things that, you know, almost just kind of get put in front of us all the time because they're almost screens in front of us just about all the time. And so um, sexual information is always just right at our fingertips. And, you know, you never know when a young child's going to, you know, find their way somewhere that, you know, maybe they heard a word and they, they found out how to type the word. You never know, you know, when someone's really going to come into contact with sexual information. And so we need to be um, teaching people about it at a, a much younger and younger age, especially when we consider just how invasive big data can be. Um, in terms of really um, potentially affecting our behavior and, and our sexual propensities and interests and desires in, in so many different ways. So that's, that's uh, I guess, the conversation that I want to be having is um, at, at times with, with people. If anyone's interested is um, how can we really, um, you know, integrate the, the topic of big data um, and technology into um, sex education? Uh, I'm just sort of supposing that maybe it's a really important conversation that that needs to be had on a larger scale. Can't hear you right now. I agree with you. It's a very important conversation to be had right now with uh, the topics you spoke about. Are you ready for some questions? Yeah, I'd love to take some questions. Okay. So the first question is, can you point to us to any resources or groups to learn more or to get started in advocacy about this? About this is the, uh, is a follow up for the uh, data being collected with respect to uh, uh, pregnancy tests, et cetera. 
Oh, to pregnancy tests and, and things. Um, right, you know, they're showing the data, like if you buy a pregnancy kit. And, and uh, so the first question, let me go back to the first question. How do we build more awareness about privacy issues with period and fertility tracking apps that are necessary health tools, but the data being collected is being anonymized and resold for advertising and market research? How do we get more awareness about those privacy issues? Okay, um, I mean, that's a really challenging question and one that I'm also really interested in, in trying to figure out the answer to. And frankly, me ha um, holding this talk is, is um, at least my first, <laughs> my, fir my first solution to trying to bring uh, some of these things to light. Um, I don't really know exactly what to do besides, um, you know, just, just start having conversations about it. Um, and as I, as I was saying before, you know, start talking to educators and and people and um and, and parents and just basically we what what really is needed is um is a way to start talking about uh about uh sexuality and, and intimate data and and just what's done with data in general like this conversation isn't just about sex obviously it's really about what's being done with data i think that sex just happens to be an interesting topic because I think a lot of people, you know, recognize the importance of privacy ar around sex. Um, and so that's the reason that I chose to bring up that example um, or this, this whole topic as an example. So, yeah, yeah I don't know. I, yeah. That ties it together very nicely. We have uh, about nine minutes. Let's go on to the next question. Uh, where do you feel the line is between legitimate usage data for product improvement, feedback and diagnostics, and then going, stepping over the line to consumer harm? Right. Um, so I, I'm going to say that I probably draw the line in, in a very different place than, than many people do. Um, I generally i mean there of course there are going to be apps where our data is collected um almost by the very nature of the app itself uh in in the way that it's used of course you know apps and platforms in order to function you know require some user input and things i guess in terms of trying to optimize apps and things it's it's really about having how do we talk about how do we um try to optimize the usage of the app the or the platform for for the user's interests and maybe stop trying to maximize the amount of time that individuals are spending on applications basically building platforms that are more centered around um the the, the health of the individual using it I, i'm sorry I'm, I'm going a little bit off track can you read can i get the question one more time because i, I that's okay. I, I think you did a very good job with that uh, question, actually. Uh, would you like, let's go on to the next one. Is that okay? Sure. Or would you like to go back? Okay. Um, while dating apps have generally added many more gender and sexuality options, it seems like both porn and big data have avoided higher fidelity genders. Could you comment on the relationship between non-CIS genders and data? Does it seem like anyone is including a broader understanding of gender to enable deeper statistics? Um, so I haven't, I actually haven't found any particular studies on this. I'm not, I'm not completely aware of how different companies are formulating ideas around gender in all of this. What I would say about big data anyway is that um, I think one of the things that is kind of interesting about it and, and, in, and in ways, you know, really compatible actually with forming with um, the idea of conceptualizing a lot of different genders um, it, and more just more nuanced um, understandings of gender is that big data, of course, you know, is, is a system that operates to essentially formulate several categories, right? And so, I mean, I imagine that naturally as big data progresses alongside um, um, users, you know, different, different individuals, you know, who are online and talking about their, you know, their different ideas of gender, that these are all things that are going to be constructed 
um, because I think that, you know, they want the, um, people who are utilizing big data for marketing, you know, they want to know as much about you, you know, they want to understand how you identify. And, um, and I think one of the things that worries me sometimes thinking in these regards actually is our, um, I, I personally, when I think of gender, I sort of don't, I, I personally don't like the idea of identifying myself in any way in particular. I know that that's not necessarily according, that's not necessarily, you know, of the, the status quo right now in terms of where, of where feminism is sort of leading. Um, but I think for, for myself anyway, um, I like to, I want to, I guess that's what my fear with, with big data and relationship to genders in, in the way that they can evolve together is that big data, I think, has the capacity to sort of take advantage of, of the ways that individuals self-identify and the ways that we formulate language and identifying each other and ourselves on social media and things. Um, and so I, there, you know, some, there's always that, I sort of imagine and, and am afraid a little bit of the capacity for big data to, to itself to play a role in the development of nuanced genders and, 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 but also in not just in the development of nuanced genders, but in, in the way that they get perceived and sort of that creation of several um, different categories of being that become normalized to some extent, right? I mean, if you're identifying in a certain way, then, um, then you're sort, then you're sort of, you know, placing yourself into a category where you're comparing yourself to a norm, not necessarily, you know, a main norm, but maybe some counterculture norm or something. Um, so, I mean, that, that's a, a really, um, that is a really interesting area of study and I would love to look more deeply into that, but the, I guess those are just how, how I think about big data and, uh, and uh, nuanced genders definitions. All right, thank you very much. That was a great answer. Let's go on to the next question. We've got a few more minutes left. How does this work with not just the person who signed up for and downloaded an app, but their partner who may not have even been in a relationship with them when the app was signed up for? Um, I'm assuming that this is in reference to the period tracking apps with the, the mirror apps. Um, so. I'm not entirely, I mean, I assume that in order to use these apps uh, to, to have, you also have to download and install, like a, a partner would have to download and install them to use uh, the mirror applications. Um, personally, I, I haven't used them. I haven't, um, I haven't looked at their interface or anything. I've only read about them. Um, but I basically, I imagine that in, in order to use them, you, you also have, of course, you have to also download and install the app. I don't, I'm not sure how to answer the question more than that at this point, or if there's more to the question that I'm missing. Well, well, thank you very much. And on behalf of all the whole 2020 attendees, the presenters and volunteers, thank you very much, Keegan, for sharing your project with us today. Oh, thank you.